West Virginia football, the best and the worst, the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs. Next on Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. All right, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down some West Virginia. We got uh, Skylar Callahan on the line, of course, from Dub V Nation. Skylar, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on, Mark. All right. Uh, I would encourage everyone to get over there to uh, follow, follow Skylar and the rest of the staff there on uh, the Mountaineers and uh, what Neil Brown has in store for us in 2019. Of course, lock it in here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, where we, on a daily basis, deliver the best in discussion, debate, and analysis. Grab the uh, Amazon link you see in the description section below to help build the channel. doesn't cost you an extra penny, just uh, helps build what we do here on a daily basis. All right, Skylar, this is a fun little discussion for the offseason during the dead time. So we're going to start with this. Best wins, exhilarating wins, however you want to frame it, uh, however far you want to go back. Some people will look at the entire history of the program, other people uh, during a lifetime or during the time that they've covered the team or followed the team. So the the most significant wins for you, there doesn't have to be a criteria, championships involved, whatever meant something to you, whether you want to go one deep or 10 deep, it is totally up to you. Wow. Uh, there's a ton of them that come to mind, obviously, uh, a lot before my time, but I want to stick within my lifetime. So the last 23 years, I'm going to say probably the most exhilarating win um, would probably have to be, I would say the Sugar Bowl back in, I think it was 2005 against Georgia. That's when Pat White and Steve Slayton really popped onto the scene and it kind of gave Mountaineer fans, uh, you know, a glimmer of hope into the future and what really started a really good run for those guys. And uh, they just kind of came out of nowhere at that point. And they, they dogged Georgia for three quarters, and then uh, the Bulldogs came back. They fought, made it a close game. Eventually, West Virginia won that game 38-35. But I'd say that was probably my most exhilarating win. Uh, a couple others that come to mind were kind of more of, of recent, and that would be um, the Clemson-Orange Bowl game where West Virginia dominated, put up 70 points in, in Dana Holgerson's first ever bowl game as a West Virginia head coach, which – kind of a sword subject right now with the fans, but uh, that one and then the first Big 12 uh, home game, uh, or I guess for first Big 12 game period against Baylor, there was a sh another shootout, 70 to 63. Geno Smith, Taewon Austin, Stedman Bailey put up monster numbers, and I think he threw for 656 yards that game, six touchdowns. Stedman Bailey had three touchdowns. Taewon Austin had three touchdowns. It was just an absolutely fun game to watch. I know some people don't really like the – the no defense factor, but I think it's it's fun. It's better than a, a ten to seven game, if you ask me. So <laughs> I think those are the most exhilarating wins in my lifetime. Uh, but I, I guess as far as um, I'd say, probably the most important win would probably be the the Penn State game back in '88. That was the first time that they had won against Penn State in some amount of years. We had trouble beating Penn State. That was kind of you know getting the monkey off their back. And eventually getting us to the, the national championship game in uh, the Fiesta Bowl against uh, Notre Dame. All right. Good stuff there. Uh, in regards to that run under Rich Rodriguez, uh, I don't know if this gets lost by a lot of college football fans, how really good West Virginia was and how that close to, um, you know, doing something big that would last in regards to the consciousness of college football nation, obviously in West Virginia minds and people that love college football like myself, I don't forget those games and I don't forget what Rich Rod and uh, Pat White, Steve Slate, those guys uh, accomplished over that uh, period of time, 2005, six and seven going 11 and one, 11 and two, 11 and two. Uh, again, beating a top five Georgia team in the Sugar Bowl, as you mentioned, dominating most of that game. It got a bit hairy late, uh, 38, 35, as you mentioned. But uh, then, if, of course, in 2007, if it wasn't for that rivalry game against Pitt, the backyard brawl, and we may be uh, alluding to that in just a second, then West Virginia is playing in a national championship game against Ohio State in 07. But uh, 11 and 1, 11 and 2, 11 and 2, uh, three straight top five finishes, a big win over Oklahoma uh, in a Orange or Fiesta Bowl, uh, one of those two. Uh, by a big margin, unexpectedly, as an underdog again, uh, West Virginia riding high at that point in the Big East and really dominating the conference and really being the only 
the only legit national program for a short period of time, but in that conference where if anybody else made it out of that conference, it was a bit of a joke in regards to how they would measure up in a BCS game. But uh, West Virginia basically made the conference legit for a number of years all by itself uh, at that point, Skyler. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, when the Big East kind of had to reshape after the likes of Virginia Tech, Miami, Boston College, all shipped out, went to the ACC. It was kind of left for West Virginia to kind of be the front runners of that conference for the longest time. And uh, really, West Virginia struggled when those teams were there with the old Big East. And then when they departed, they were looked at as the team in the conference to beat. They had the target on their back at all times. And when Pat White was here, they they took that and ran with it. And they had a really good um, you know run there. And it, that led into the Bill Stewart years and then the Dana Hogerson years. Um, I guess even one game I kind of forgot to mention was the Oklahoma game in the Fiesta Bowl where Rich Rodriguez had just taken that job to go to Michigan. Bill Stewart comes in. Everyone's expecting Oklahoma just to run West Virginia out of the building. And it was quite the opposite, as you mentioned. And I think that was probably one of the most exhilarating wins also just because no one expected that to happen, especially after a team like West Virginia was one win away to get to the national championship. Yeah, it was such a crazy season in 07. Uh, Oklahoma was another one of those teams that was in the mix late in the season as uh, teams were falling uh, by the droves, and it ended up Ohio State and LSU with the uh, the Bayou Bengals winning the national championship with two losses, the only team that's done it in modern times. Uh, all right, we got to flip the script on you, Skyler. So we got uh, Skyler Callahan on the line from Dub V Nation talking West Virginia football. And really, this is a discussion for college football fans because if you love the games and love the Bulls and the postseason play and the big games and the history of the programs, then you dive in uh, regardless of who you root for because we all love college football. And this is a fun discussion talking about the exhilarating highs. The crushing losses, uh, the really disappointing losses, uh, Skyler. Again, I'll let you make the framework of of what matters. Uh, but basically, what what has really hit you hard and stayed with you? Well, I think <laughs> the the one that sticks out. Obviously, everyone knows that what I'm going to say. If you're a West Virginia fan, is the one and seven against Pitt. You know, you're coming in. All you need to do is just win the game. It doesn't matter if it's ugly, pretty, or whatever. Win the game. You're in the national championship against a four or a three and eight pit team and Pat White goes out with an injury, doesn't come back until late in the fourth quarter. He was not the same quarterback. And the injury was to his non-throwing thumb. There's a lot of speculation as to whether he was really wanting to go into the game, if he could go into the game, if Rich Rodriguez was holding him out. There's a whole lot of different theories that people have about that game. And we don't know if we'll probably never know the truth about it. But that was the most, I would say, upsetting loss. I remember that as a kid. I was, a, you know, probably, uh, let's see, 2007, I was nine years old, nine, ten years old at the time, maybe 11. And uh, I remember crying in that game because <laughs> I, I, I was ready for us to get to the national championship. Uh, I didn't know if they were ever going to get back. And that was by far the most disappointing loss. Um, I would say probably as of late, uh, probably the Oklahoma game this past year or the Oklahoma State game where – you are sitting in, in a great position to make the Big 12 championship. If you beat Oklahoma State, which they were up 31-14 on at halftime, all you have to do is get, beat Oklahoma the following week, and then you're really in the in the playoff discussion, And if you get, especially if you win the Big 12 championship. So I think this past year was kind of a letdown. Uh, the, the, the last two, three games of the season was really disappointing. And obviously going back to um, 1993, really when – say it was a disappointing loss because there really wasn't a loss. It was more so of a loss on the, the selection committee leaving West Virginia out. A lot of people forget about this. West Virginia ran the table in 1993. They went undefeated. They had beaten Boston College to end the season. And instead, they put in a one-loss Florida State in the national championship. West Virginia went, to, to, went on to get blown out in the bowl game against Florida because they really did not want to be there. But uh, a lot of people forget about that one. That's kind of why the BCS started. I'd, I'd like to say it was one reason why, but um, not a, not an actual loss, but I would say that's a loss. And then the actual loss in the national championship against Notre Dame in 1988, where Major Harris gets hurt in the first uh, half of the game, and it was never the same after that. You know, Skyler, I had forgotten about that, but that's absolutely right. The 1993 situation in which uh, most Notre Dame fans actually get upset, and rightfully so. They beat Florida State head-to-head -head 
both teams finished 10 and one or 11 and one. I don't know. Uh, that was uh, during a time in which uh, there was a lot of mix of 11 and 12 game seasons, but they both had one loss. Uh, Florida State and Charlie Ward, the Heisman Trophy winner, went to Notre Dame, lost by a touchdown. And uh, it, it seems inconceivable that Notre Dame would get left out of a national championship game with uh, the same resume as somebody else. But Florida State, despite the loss head to head, they went with one loss to take on Nebraska uh, and won the national championship uh, against the Huskers. A really close game, like 18 16, missed field goal at the end. But uh, yeah, West Virginia. You could say what you will about the uh, the schedule at the time, but uh, that was basically what happened. It came down to uh, a schedule perception call, and uh, despite the undefeated season, there you go. Another another place in history in which the system has let us down, uh, and it let down uh, West Virginia, certainly uh, out of the Big East in 1993 at 11-0. Good stuff with uh, Skylar Callahan talking uh, West Virginia football, looking back at history, Dub V Nation. You can catch him right there talking Mountaineers and as we get prepared for 2019. All right, Skylar, let's uh, go to players. Uh, so again, within your frame of reference, which sounds to be about 23 years since you've been alive, favorite player all time, best player all time. Oh man, I'd say my favorite player of all time um, in my 23 years would probably be Tavon Austin. Just an electrifying player. A lot of people compared him to DeAnthony Thomas at Oregon. Um, he was just an electrifying player. It doesn't matter how he impacted the game. All you had to do was get him the ball in open space and he was going to make things work and, and, and create magic. He was going to get out of some crazy situations that only magicians could get out of. I mean, you heard the quote before, not even in a phone booth with Tavon Austin, you cannot tackle this kid. And uh, he was just fun to watch, especially in that Oklahoma game where he moved from receiver to running back. And in his first game at running back, ran over 340 yards in his first ever game at running back in college. That's just something special with this talent. And unfortunately, hasn't really panned out the same way in the NFL. But I think once he gets his chance, he's going to be a nice role player. Uh, whether it's with the Dallas Cowboys or somebody else, but uh, very once in a lifetime kind of player that comes around West Virginia. They don't come around all that often. And ever since, um, you know, everyone's been kind of looking at who's going to be the next Tavon Austin. Well, there's only one Tavon Austin. And, you know, when, when I talk to recruits all the time about who's your favorite West Virginia player or what made West Virginia pop to you, what put them on the map to you, and they always refer back to Tavon Austin. This is still, you know, six, seven years ago that he's been gone. So, I'd say he was my favorite player, and as far as best player all time, uh, at least in my lifetime, has got to be Pat White. I mean, four and zero bowl games, the, the just the true leader he was, and just like Tavon Austin, was very hard to stop. You know, a lot of people questioned his arm. He had a very talented arm, even though he was more known for his legs, but a very good dual threat quarterback that a lot of people forget about. They like to think, you know, Johnny Manziel, Tim Tebow, Cam Newton, and. A lot of people just kind of forget about Pat White, but he had a very special run for those four years um, and that a lot of people just tend to look the other way on. And uh, But as, as all time, I don't think it's a question um, that Major Harris is definitely the best player to ever put on the blue and gold uniform. Major Harris. Okay, just as a college player, of course, we're not talking about right. uh, moving on to the next level. I would say off the top of my head, wouldn't Jeff Hostetler be the best quarterback? Yeah. Uh, produced by West Virginia, won a Super Bowl, of course, with the New York Giants. Despite the proliferation of the passing game in the last five years, uh, of course, starting in the 80s is when uh, teams started to pass certain teams across the country and there started to pop some numbers. But then, um, and obviously it progressed beyond that. But West Virginia was one of those programs, uh, I'm looking at 2012. Uh, yeah, the Tavon Austin numbers, uh, the last two years he was there, 215 catches in two years, 101, 114. And then the season that he and uh, Stedman and Bailey put together, uh, together with uh, Geno Smith when uh, Geno threw 42 touchdowns and six picks. And they each had 114 catches and Stedman Bailey had 25 touchdowns. And they had 37 touchdowns between them. Yeah, that's, that's crazy stuff. I mean, you just don't see that every day. And honestly, ever since those guys left, I think Mountaineer fans expect that from the receivers and the quarterbacks because they were just putting up such crazy, unheard of, absurd numbers. And that's hard to fill those shoes. I mean, especially 
I mean, how would you feel about being the guy coming in right after those guys? You know, the Clint Trickets and Kevin Whites and Mario Alford, you kind of came in a year or two after those guys having to put up, you know, near the, or similar production as those guys did. It is just unheard of. You don't see it. And, um, and and the crazy thing is Stedman Bailey, as you mentioned, there's 25 touchdowns. Didn't even win the Belitnikoff that year. I forget who won. I think it was another Alabama receiver. But for for Mountaineer fans, they've always said if Stedman Bailey can't win the Belitnikoff award and having 25 touchdowns in a season, I don't know when it's ever going to happen. <laughs> and I kind of tend to agree with them. Of course, uh, Mark Bolger also had some success in the NFL with the uh, St. Louis Rams, uh, replacing Kurt Warner, had about three really good seasons with the Rams when they were still good in the early 2000s. Uh, I'm looking at some West Virginia uh, players, and and then they start popping in my head. Of course, I forgot about him and him and him, but I'm going to go way back. In terms of a pro, I'm going to say that probably the best West Virginia player of all time is Sam Huff. Yeah. Sam Huff, uh, definitely one of the best players. In the uh, he's a pro football Hall of Famer. Uh, Daryl Talley was an integral player, all pro with the uh, Buffalo Bills at linebacker and a number of guys, obviously, with that kind of football tradition down the line. All right, we got Skylar Callahan on the line talking West Virginia football, looking back at history, talking about the highs and the lows, best players, best games, but also the downers. Uh, that have bitten the uh, Mountaineers. And of course, 2007, I knew it's going to be at the <laughs> top of the list right there. Uh, everyone remembers that and the crazy uh, playoff race to the BCS championship game in 07 involving like seven or eight teams. All right, we're, we're going to make some changes here. Skylar, you, you have full dictatorship, full uh-huh. authority, sovereignty over West Virginia football. And, and I'm going to leave this wide open. You can go back in time. You can change coaches. You can change decisions, uniforms, whatever you want to do. If you don't like the fight song, whatever you want to do, uh, what would you change about West Virginia football? Honestly, not much. You know, I like I like the way it is. It's built. You know, the, the culture that they have, uh, the fan base is passionate. Um, there's not much I would change about it. Um, if there would be anything, I'd say more for the fans is to you know. And I'm sure this is kind of around the country as well, but to lower the the ticket prices because the ticket prices have gone up, um, the the tailgating has been completely changed within the last ten years. And a lot of people have complained about that, um, but I would say more so getting more students to the game. And it's really not about the football team. I think it's getting the student section filled up. Sometimes they get filled up and. It, they really don't get all the way filled until set the second quarter, and then they leave by the third. I'd like to see those guys hang around, stick around. And if you want to be one of the most passionate fan bases in college football, I think you have to be there early and be the last ones to leave. I think you got to stay all the way through the game. But, um, yeah, I, I'd like to see them win a national championship, obviously. That's that's one thing I wish I could go back and say. I uh, wish Major Harris didn't get hurt in the national championship. wish Pat White didn't get hurt in that pit game. But other than that, I don't, I don't think I'd change too much about it. Uh, I think it's going to write its own script. Good uh, discussion with Skylar Callahan talking West Virginia football as uh, we do each and every day here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, uh, breaking down the teams that you love, breaking down each and every conference. So dive into the videos if you're coming across our channel for the first time or maybe you've uh, seen a video or two, 7,000 videos. We bring in the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the nation. Of course, analysis from myself. Got a uh, series going right now, Skylar, where I'm ranking everyone's schedule. I have yet to get to West Virginia. I've got all 70 teams. That's all the power fives and the major independents. I'm up to about 61, something in that range. I'm trying to think where I had West Virginia, but I don't want to give it away. But they're uh, (laughs) considerably higher than uh, where we are right now. Pretty tough slate for West Virginia. And, of course, the uh, game against NC State highlights the non-conference. All right. Made some changes to West Virginia football, although you, you're you're pretty you're pretty good on uh, where the Mountaineers stand. But uh, if you would like to and could make one change to Big Twelve football, what would you change? Oh man, uh, I, I I do like the fact that you play everybody every year. Uh, that's that's one thing that a lot of conferences don't do, and I think that's what makes you a true conference. You play everybody a year. Um, but I would say we need to split the, the conference into a divisions. Keep the 10 teams. Don't add two more teams because then you can't add everybody. But keep uh, 10 teams, make it two divisions of five teams each. That way you're not playing, you know, where we have that situation where you – or maybe you add the two teams, actually. Add two teams 
And uh, that way you're not playing the same team twice or there's no guarantee that you're playing back-to-back weeks that people fear. That could have happened this year with West Virginia, Oklahoma. Had West Virginia beat Oklahoma, it would have been a rematch the very next week with West Virginia, Oklahoma. So maybe you add two teams and lessen that chance. But, you know, that could happen with really any conference, to be honest with you. But I I do like the fact uh, that there is 10 teams and you play everybody. But I wouldn't mind seeing a Houston getting into the Big 12, as especially now that that Dana Holgerson is there. I bet fans would kill to have that opportunity for him to make that trip back to Morgantown. So, Skyler, you would either love or hate. I don't think there would be much in between. Either love or hate my plan. I restructured college football a few years ago, and I I produced this video. I need to find it and repost it uh, now that I've got a few other people watching. Uh, I basically structured uh, the conferences uh, uniformly. So no 10 teams and 14 teams. I went 12 teams with everyone. I brought in some of the best group of fives, and I went to six conferences. So you were no longer in the Big 12. I, I made very few changes, but geographically, this thing worked. I had six conferences, 12 teams, 72 teams, and I rebuilt the Big East. And I had West Virginia, Louisville, Syracuse, Pitt, Penn State, Army, Navy up there. I had a true Big East conference. I love that. See, I think that's what what really needs to get back – or what West Virginia needs to get back to is at least playing in a conference that the fans can travel to a lot easier. It's a lot easier on on the coaches, on the players. Because after a while, as we all know, jet lag is a real thing. And I think it'd be very beneficial for not only fans, but the players and the coaches as well to play in, you know, a conference where they can easily get to instead of have to fly halfway across the country to get to those games. But I love that. I love that conference, uh, bringing in some of the old rivals. I know the ACC is a a talk that West Virginia fans would love to be in, get the, the Pitt, Virginia Tech, Miami, Boston College, Louisville, Syracuse, those teams. Uh, so, yeah, I'd love to bring the old Big East back. I think uh, I'd really love to bring the old old Big East basketball conference back as well because that was that was some some special stuff that went on in Madison Square Garden. But, yeah, I, I'd love that plan. I think a lot of Mountaineer fans would approve. Yeah, so I went to 12 teams with everyone, and uh, I'd have to squeeze my brain to try to figure out which 12 teams went to the Big East, but I'm sure I could do it. The teams that I just mentioned, plus I plucked uh, Maryland and Rutgers out of the Big Ten. They don't belong there. And yeah, it was a true Big East conference. I took the Northern teams out of the ACC. I put in Central Florida and South Florida. I had everybody at 12 teams. So the one minus in West Virginia from the Big 12, but I added Texas A&M, Missouri, took them out of the SEC where they belong, take them back to the Big 12 and add Houston. So the three additional to the Big 12, Houston, Missouri, Texas A&M, take out West Virginia. They're at 12. I had 12 all around and it made a whole lot of sense, at least to me. And I had Notre Dame in the Big 10 because they need to be in a conference. I agree. I, I think a lot of people like to see Notre Dame in the conference. <laughs> and they, uh, I understand they've got a deal with the ACC, and this is all fantasy talk, but uh, they're sitting in the middle of Indiana, and they've had long-standing, like, 100-year rivalries with Michigan, Michigan State, and Purdue. Why they're not playing in the Big Ten. Who knows? <laughs> and I don't care about school, academics, anything like that. I'm just talking football. That's that's right. all we're dealing with here. Yeah, I think with Notre Dame, we all know it's a little about the money oh. and the ACC deals. <laughs> But I Which think leads us to, Skyler, you, you can change anything in college football nationally. What would you change? Wow. Um, I, I guess I would go with the, the paid athlete deal. I think they need to be paid at least something. And I know this is a sore subject for some. Uh, I was once a college athlete, and I know the struggles. And I know people say, well, you get the tuition, you get full room and board. But that's not really – enough and i know a lot of times i was scrounging for changes to find something to eat at times because you got to remember a lot of these colleges they don't have places for you to go to eat at 10 30 11 o'clock at night when you're getting out of practice or a film session or, or a lift or anything like that so I, I think they need to be paid and i think the other thing i would love to see the playoff expanded i know a lot of people say keep it at four and because the four best teams always get there but i would like to see it expand to six and i think I'd like to see the power five champions get in and you have the one wild card where you take just the top six teams. I think either way it works and it makes college football more exciting in the postseason. 
All right, Skyler. Well, we've got a bit of a debate there, but uh, I'm definitely on board with expanding the playoffs. But this is not my platform. This is your platform today, so I'm not going to go through my whole series of arguments there. But I definitely go with eight, and uh, I, I've got reasons why six doesn't work, and I certainly don't think the four best teams uh, always get selected. All right, Skyler, appreciate you stopping by and I uh, would like to encourage everyone again uh, to join Skyler and I will let you, Skyler, take it away from here in regards to letting everyone know where they can find you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. And uh, yeah, you can follow W Nation on Twitter at W Nation. You can follow me on Twitter at Deviant Callahan. You can also follow our show Between the Ears podcast at Between the Ears. And we're going to be live every Friday on WBES Charleston, 950 a.m. at six o'clock. And also today is DVN's third birthday. So I just want to throw that out there. I want to give a special thanks uh, uh, to the fans and guys like you, Mark, who give us the platform to expand our fan base. And uh, we're pre we appreciate you guys. And uh, thank you for everyone for listening. Well, that's very cool, Skylar. So we're both celebrating today. So I just ordered a cake where we're, we're bringing on a big cake uh, or a little cake uh, tomorrow on the show. I'm anticipating being at 10,000. I'm about 40 subscribers away from 10,000. I typically pick up six, seven hundred a month. So, you know, 30 a day, something in that range. So we should be around 10,000 uh, when we do our live stream tomorrow night. So I ordered a cake and we're going to celebrate here. Well, we'll get you there and let's have a piece together. How about that? <laughs> awesome. There we go, Skylar. We appreciate you stopping by. It's always a good talk. Thank you, Mark.